Thank you and welcome back to our webinar on population health. I'm joined here today with our Chief of Population Health at Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Adam Myers, our Associate Chief of Clinical Operations, Dr. Michelle Medina, and I'm Nira Vakaria, Associate Chief of Value-Based Operations in our population health unit called Cleveland Clinic Community Care. So we'd like to spend the next few minutes reflecting on what are some of the lessons that we've learned towards our journey of population health. We wish it had been a linear line, but in, in many cases there have been uh, twists and turns that uh, we'd like to go over today. So despite the fact that our system has excelled in the complex care of the sickest patients for close to 100 years, we decided a few years ago that it was really important for us to translate our success in the care of individuals to become the care of entire populations. This is because it aligned the interests of our patients and communities, the marketplace, and our own caregivers. If we could bucket the lessons we've learned, we'd say that they're in three key areas. Number one, how do we move effectively and safely to a team-based care model that is friendly to the patient's and community's needs? Number two, what is the value of aligning the overall operating model of how you perhaps run clinics or an overall system with the desired care model that is enabled to deliver on the outcomes promised by population health? And number three, what have we learned about what patients and communities both need and desire through this process? Well, let's start with number one. We, like most other health systems, have become very good at the things Dr. Myers referred to in our opening discussion. We're world-renowned at complex cardiac surgery, at organ transplants, the treatment of complex medical conditions like cancer or autoimmune disorders. These are things people travel from all over the world to seek care at the Cleveland Clinic for. And we do excellent on that case-by-case -case basis. However, the systems and the protocols, the practices that are needed to promote wellness and prevent illness around the across the communities that we serve required some retooling of our traditional care model. We started this journey by intentionally moving towards a team-based care model. As Dr. Medina described earlier, this consisted of the addition of new team members, like clinical pharmacists, nurses to coordinate care for complex patients, behavioral health specialists, etc. Each one trained to provide the services to patients that empower them to manage their own health and wellness, which would then result in improved outcomes at lower cost. Sounds perfect, doesn't it? We expected that the addition of all these team members would be welcomed by all, and, but we found that effective teamwork does not happen automatically. Part of our diagnosis of what happened was that there wasn't necessarily understanding that we had provided about what is each other's role and responsibility as we build the team around that patient panel. There wasn't necessarily clarity on what success looked like for that team. And not everyone on that team was comfortable with using data, analytics, and new tools to inform the care that was delivered. And perhaps most importantly, we hadn't done enough to ensure that our patients underst understood why are there new faces? What is, what is behind the inclusion of more team members in their care? Hence, we worked to overcome these issues. And I'd like to invite Michelle Medina to talk about how we did that and what are some of the lessons we wish we had known back then that we now know uh, so, Michelle, let's turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, when we talked about investing in our workforce, it's easy for us to go into tools, resources, technology. But what became very clear to us very quickly was that this is a big culture change. This is really about, as Nirav pointed out, um, helping the teams understand how do you work together in this space differently? How do you work together in this space with all the tools, the data, the resources, the new folks who are coming into your team more efficiently so that you're not tripping over each other, but rather you're seamlessly working to make sure that every patient's unique needs are actually addressed. And to that end, we decided that we needed a platform. We needed to be able to actually spread the why of, of this entire endeavor and then be able to help people come to realize that the why is also resonating with their own why of why they came into healthcare to begin with. And so we put together a program called STAMP. It's a lovely acronym, Strengthening Teams in the Advanced Management of Populations. It's now become a brand in our entire organization. But STAMP really meant bringing the teams together in with dedicated time uh, to do this effort and in a space that allows them to have conversations in a very safe way so that they can continue to challenge each other and really brainstorm through what will this mean for them within their local practices. STAMP has given fruit to a lot of new things we didn't even consider 
the input of the teams, they continue to talk to each other, they now have a platform similar to social media that they continue to actually um, exchange ideas. It has become this entire effort that has swelled from the ground up instead of us actually pushing it down. And to that end, I think um, realizing quickly that culture change is what's paramount has really helped us move the model forward. What are some of the activities that happened in that panel management time? So during panel management time, which again is now branded as stamp time, um, teams actually come together. And they come together initially in front of registries, and now they've become much more sophisticated about it. They pull specific population lists, and as a team they work through what does Mr. Jones need for the next three months. Mrs. Smith's diabetes is not under control. Should we call in the diabetes educator? Should we maybe send somebody out in the home? Maybe she's frail, hasn't been able to make her um, appointments with us. And they brainstorm through that and then assign tasks to say, you will make sure that we have a phone call in place by the end of the day. You will see if we can actually get social work or home-based visit to be able to actually get Mrs. Smith um, to, to attend to what she needed. And in that, discipline and in the cadence of doing that over time they're really realizing um, important health outcomes. So we really are shifting from who's on my schedule today mm -hmm. to who's out there that has entrusted their health to us yes. that could potentially need some help. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. Now, Adam and Michelle, I'd love to ask you a follow-up. Uh, I think a across the industry mm -hmm. in healthcare, mm -hmm. as we work towards this culture mm -hmm. change, the importance of engaging the physician is, is paramount. And we've learned a lot of lessons in that space, yes. haven't yeah. we? Yes. Are there any that you'd be willing to share with our audience? Yes. Um, I think we really have to consider what's on the physician's plate. So again, part of the culture change is also asking physicians and helping them reimagine what will the work of the day mean for you? Are you going to stay on your hamster wheel of seeing patients every 20 minutes, every 40 minutes? Or can we take intentional time at the course of the day for you to be able to step back talk to your team and think about, to your point Adam, who needs help, who's out there and actually um, needs some outreach for the team. Um, listening to them, making sure that we actually understand the pain points and more importantly responding to those pain points in a timely manner, being able to address their data needs, being able to address their space needs, being able to address the barriers around scheduling. That um, ensures that there's trust in this particular um, relationship. They know we're working towards the solutions as they also bring forth the solutions that work for them. Mm -hmm. You know, it really strikes me that what we're really doing is incorporating some of the lessons that our specialty colleagues have known for some time. Transplant teams sit together with regularity and coordinate care. They talk about what's going on with each patient. They talk about the flow of their work. They talk about patients that aren't even seeing them that day so that they can ensure that they remain whole. The same thing for oncology patients, for rehab patients. There's team-based rounding, essentially. But in the ambulatory space, we've been on, as you described it, sort of that treadmill of sorts, where it's just patient after patient after patient after patient, and not a lot of pausing to think and work proactively as teams to do things differently. And I think what we find is that when we are able to incorporate that into the schedule, it is not only better for the patients, but it is patently rewarding for our colleagues as well. I agree. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So we developed this curriculum and we were able to successfully get our teams to understand the why and how of population health. And these teams were activated to practice in this model. But we then had to tackle the issue of how our system of care was organized to be able to enable these behaviors. As Dr. Myers mentioned earlier, we were exceedingly good at managing who's on the schedule today, but not necessarily who on our panels most needed our help that day if we were going to be successful at preventing them from getting sick. For decades, our typical day, as was just mentioned, had been to arrive in the morning, see 20 to 25 patients in 20 minute intervals over the course of the day, maybe pause for lunch if there was time, and finish the day often at home completing charts and addressing telephone calls, messages, etc. This was not sustainable. There really wasn't any opportunity to pause, come together as that team, review the data about the panel, and see who needed help. And importantly, to strategize about how to get them what they needed to improve their outcomes. Why was this the case when we knew that a data-informed team-based model was necessary to improve health and wellness? Well, the answer really lie in the fact that our operating model, 
which really only considered productive activity, the in-person visits to the office, was still present for us. Any time that was spent by physicians doing anything but seeing patients was considered an expense, even if we knew it helped to drive those better outcomes. So we endeavored to change the rules, such that our desired care model drove the payment model and not the other way around, which had been historically the case. We're updating what we consider to be productive time to include all those things Michelle mentioned, huddles, panel management conferences, telephone encounters with patients, time reviewing patient data to create personalized care plans, virtual visits, et cetera. To ensure all of these activities are supported, we knew we had to break out of the traditional fee-for-service reimbursement model. But we weren't quite ready to take on full capitated risk. So we started to work with our payer partners who were very willing to do this with us to move into what we call a primary care capitation model. This allowed us to guarantee revenue for our primary care practices based on the number of lives that they managed and not necessarily based on how the care was delivered. As long as we achieved the right clinical and financial outcomes, the rest took care of itself. Think of this as a subscription model that allows the primary care team and the patients to, to determine how and when the care should be delivered, not the insurance company. By the end of this year, we will have 70% of our primary care patients in this type of model, and have found all of the major insurers receptive to doing this. So at this point, we had care teams that are activated around the promise of population health. We, did not, we were working towards an operating model that rewards and incentivizes working this way. We are now poised, we believe, to drive even more success for the patients and the communities that we serve. And in terms of the lessons we've learned, third and perhaps the most important has been that we've been quite fortunate to have patients as our guides as we go through this transition to a population health care model. Formally, we have patient and family advisory councils that each of our regional practices convene quarterly to solicit ideas and feedback from patients directly on how we can improve. This has served as an incredibly rich source of information on how to align with the needs and the desires of our communities. For example, it's feedback from these councils that informed us that patients really didn't understand why we had all these additional team members like behavioral health specialists, nurse care coordinators, et cetera, involved in their care. They've also taught us much about how they would like to access us, what services they desire, et cetera. We also increasingly recognize the need to address all the determinants of health that they've suggested. This requires us understanding the different factors that impact health most of which are not addressed traditionally by healthcare providers, and building partnerships with the community to address those. I'd like to turn it over to Adam to review what we have been learning as we listen to our patients and our communities about how healthcare providers can better partner to improve health outcomes. Thank you, Narav. The operative word in what you just said was listen. All too often, healthcare systems have assumed that they've understood what the needs of the community were around them much to the dismay of the community. Uh, and it has led to some heavy-handed activities, some missteps, and things like that. Uh, it's not unique to us, it's common across the country. But last year, we decided to do something differently. A year ago, Dr. Mahalovic, our CEO, walked through the surrounding communities, and we met together as a team with community leaders and people who live there, residents, and spent an evening, a very impactful evening, having dinner with people from the community and uh, respectively in the Fairfax community immediately adjacent to where our main campus is. And that dinner really was eye-opening. The residents shared their felt needs, shared their concerns, and shared what they felt were barriers to life in general for them and their health, uh, their healthy future. From that came a, a list, a prioritized list of things that have turned into a strategy for us. And now we're very close to being able to deliver on many of what those prioritized self-declared needs were for the community. Things such as impacting the food desert, things such as affordable and safe housing, and last but not least, the opportunity for meaningful, rewarding, and sustainable employment. The other thing that we learned was that many local organizations are already doing amazing things around us, very quietly going about this on a day-to-day -day basis. And we don't have to, nor would it be appropriate for us to come in and take over that effort. 
Rather, our goal is to stand with them, support them, and partner with them in creating a place called better for those who struggle in our midst. In closing, we would like to thank you for tuning into this webinar where we've reviewed what population health means, why the time is right to develop the necessary capabilities to succeed in it, and what has and hasn't worked for us in developing those capabilities here. For anyone who is viewing this, we welcome your feedback, contributions, and questions in the future. Thank you. Thank you.